Welcome back to the Arise interview. Despite the notable progress made in improving health care in sub-Saharan Africa over the past few years, considerable health challenges remain throughout the region. Although this subcontinent has largely been spared from the brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are growing calls for governments to bolster public health systems to prepare for future pandemics and health challenges. Those calls have grown more persistent following a grim warning from the WHO that the pandemic would go on a year longer without adequate preparations. So how resilient are health systems like Nigeria's, Africa's most populous nation, in weathering the storm? caused by diseases. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now in the studio by Felix Obi, a health systems policy expert with decades of experience in the design and implementation of public health programs and initiatives to advance universal health coverage in Africa. Mr. Obi has led the implementation of programs on polio eradication, HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and other public health programs. And he joins me now in the studio. Good to have you here, Obi. My pleasure. Yeah, I mean, let's start from the fact that Nigeria's uh, health system is, uh, you know, witnessing lots of shocks. I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, ex uh, you know, op opened up the underbelly of the health system. And since then, we've seen government trying to, you know, bring uh, measures that are temporary, albeit. But how do we ensure that we have the health system that withstands future pandemics, and other health emergencies in such a way that we do not use these haphazard measures. Thank you for having me once again. So for Nigeria as a country, we certainly we don't have a very strong health system. And you recall around 2000 when WHO released that first ranking, we are, we are very, very at the bottom. Now, following that, a lot of health system reform measures have been taken by the government. So if you recall, during Obasanjo's time, there was the health sector reform program. And that program kind of laid the foundation for the reforms we are experiencing in the health sector. For instance, the health policy we had before 20, uh, that year 2000 was 1988, and it was uh, Professor Luke Ransom Kuti that developed that. So we never revised that policy and all. And so when Professor Lambo, under on the other side and just started. So he began that process of reforming the health system. For instance, um, there was a particular program, and it's instructive for me to mention that it was called the Change Agents Program. So it was realized that for you to reform your health sector, it cannot happen by external forces. So you need like in-house change agents, Nigerians who, are, who understand the health system, who are passionate about the health system, who understand what the problems are, the challenges, and then can can think through innovative you uh, know, and solutions. And that's why, for example, in 2005, if I may take you back to the yeah. same Obasanjo government you're yeah. talking about, there was that national health insurance Excellent. you know, system that was put in place I in 2005. But coincidentally, f between 2005 and now, the growth of the NHIS has been very, very slow, hampered by lots of allegations of corruption, you know, poor services and all of that. That was one. And then in 2014, we had the National Health Bill yes. being introduced. Yet, we seem not to be getting it right. What exactly is the challenge okay, in so implementing these policies? So good enough, you mentioned the National Health Act. So during that reform, so all the policy reforms we've had, we are never backed by any legal framework. So if you have a policy and the government leaves, the next government is not bound by law to continue with that reform. So that was the beginning of what led to the development of the National Health Bill then. So now I will come back to the NHIS. So I think sometimes the way when we talk about NHIS, we need to first of all ask ourselves, what was the original intention? Universal coverage for almost everyone. Yes, but the law did not say everybody in Nigeria. Recall that the program that NHIS ran for this 10 years or more was for the federal civil servants. I think we need to be clear about that. It was for- Starting from there and yeah. then to the private sector Excellent. and then it cascades down. Yeah, so we had this private sector component. But one thing the NHIS did in 2015 was to decentralize health insurance. And you recall that health insurance is not really on the concurrent list. So it's exclusive to the federal government. But they had to, when we recognize that, there are barriers why states are not uptaking health insurance. 
the, because of our complex political economy, where um, so for states to contribute and bring to the federal, you know, uh, it's not really very possible, or not that it's not possible, but it's not very realistic. So based on evidence, because some studies were conducted to ask why are states not taking up health insurance? And so 2015, here in Abuja, there was a National Council on Health, an emergency National Council on Health. The, the purpose of that com uh, uh, health, uh, Council on Health was to, first of all, agree on the framework for operationalizing the National Health Act and then the decentralization of the health insurance. So there were guidelines we agreed, and then that, that is why if you, I don't know if you know, but states, almost all the states now have health insurance. Yeah, uh, very interesting case. indeed. Yeah. As we continue with this conversation, I just want you to talk to us about why we continue to have the dilapidating uh, primary health care centers across the country, which are the ones very closest Absolutely. to the grassroots. And then, of course, you had the reforms in the tertiary health yes. centers, uh, just like the uh, teaching hospitals we have across the country, started by Obasanjo. Absolutely. I remember there was a company called Vamed then that was yes, given. I and that. Yeah, sure. Since then, we still haven't had solid health centers that will be specialist areas that won't allow our presidents and other top politicians okay. to be going abroad. Sure. Okay, so um, for the primary health centers, the fact remains that I think a lot of times we put the burden on the federal government. But in our health policy, or even when we look at our, uh, the different levels of government, so our health policy in principle uh, takes care of tertiary health care, then state, secondary, and then local government, the primary. But of course, we know that a lot of states have tertiary hospitals and all. So, but the fact is that the federal government, we have the National Primary Health Care Development Agency that has been working over the years to provide the policy direction, technical support to the states and all. And we need to m come to the point where we are holding states and local government accountable for primary health care. So for instance, in my local government, I was born in a primary health center. And over the years, obviously it has dilapidated. We cannot be expecting the federal government to be the one who will repair those. So I think our citizens need to come to the point where they recognize that Health. Yeah, but th that's why we have a government in place, whether it's the local government or state or, or federal. Now, let's talk about the uh, tertiary okay. aspect in, in terms of teaching hospitals and all of that very quickly because yeah. we have less than 120 seconds okay. left. Sorry. Talk about why the reforms in the teaching hospitals seem to have failed. And, for example, even the national hospital here seems not to be delivering so much. Yeah, so, for, so when we say tertiary hospital, it should be exclusively for referral services. So, but because our, in the pyramid of our health system, so we have the primary health at the bottom and then secondary in the middle. The general hospitals. So, yeah, so because the, the primary health care system is not functioning uh, at an optimal level, so you do have all the kind of conditions that should be treated at the primary health center. Everybody goes to national hospital in Abuja. So most tertiary hospitals are actually overwhelmed by conditions that they shouldn't ordinarily be handling. So they should have specialists who treat cases that are referred from second, primary, secondary level to them. So that's the, one of the primary reasons why. But the other bit too is that we are not investing enough in health infrastructure. Yeah, uh, uh, in less than 60 seconds. Okay. We've seen the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority yeah. beginning to say, okay, they will push for health centers of excellence in the six geopolitical zones and so on. Do you think that reform is enough? At least if we have six good working tertiary hospitals, maybe that could help solve the problem. No, they, are, they are really doing enough, like the cancer center in Lagos. I know FMC Moir had two. The, there are a couple of centers where we have the centers of excellence. But notwithstanding, the fact is that we do have the, if we are not maximizing, if I use the word, even the investments we already have in the health sector. Because there are other things aside of the, uh, the infrastructure. You have the human resource, you have other things like that you need <laughs> which, to which has led to many doctors actually uh, going on strike. Yeah. And I just want you to touch very quickly, 30 seconds, how do you think we can stop the strikes by medical practitioners? Um, I think we need to find out why are they going on strike, first of all. So if we are able to address those systemic issues, and then, of course, there is also the other component of the power and interest among well, health workers or between uh, uh, different categories of health have workers. Time, I've been told that... Uh, our time is up now. Felix Obi, we must thank you so much for joining us on the Arising Technology.